This is Trepwire Week in Review for week ending March 25th, 2022. I'm Martha Kocher with Trep, a data modeling and analytics firm for the CMBS commercial real estate and CLO markets. I'm with Manis Clancy, Senior Managing Director, and Lonnie Henry, Head of Siri and Advisory Services. This week, the U.S. will expand sanctions on Russia as the Russia-Ukraine conflict is mired in a stalemate. And the Fed takes a hawkish tone in its fight against inflation. Oil prices peaked at more than 120 a barrel before sliding again, and in economic data, durable goods orders fell more than expected, and jobless claims were the lowest since 1969, signs that a tight labor market may keep boosting wage inflation. Manus, the moves in the Treasury were a little up and down. What's behind some of that? Well, when you look at the moves in the Treasury market, we wrote about this this morning in Treb Wire, or perhaps it was yesterday, that the reaction to Jerome Powell's remark, Fed Chair Powell's remarks, which were, you know, 50 basis point rate hikes were on the table. It was like we were living in two alternative universes. The bond markets took him at his word and interest rates, spo- interest rates shot up this week uh, considerably. I think the 10-year got as high as 240 at one point. It's a little bit lower than that now, but... Um, you know, 80 basis points higher than it was two or three months ago. Um, the two-year, I think, got as high as about 230, 225, 230. So the bond market was taking Powell's commentary very seriously. The equity markets, not so much. The equity markets almost shrugged this off as if to say, we dare you. We don't believe that you're going to do this. They'd be as hawkish as you're sounding. Or perhaps it's well, maybe we'll finally wrestle inflation to the ground and we'll get costs under control. But whatever it was, we saw a spectacular equity rally over, you know, like six of the last eight days, including today, which the NASDAQ was up another 2%. So usually at times like this, maybe because I'm a bond guy, I tend to believe the bond guys. When I see rates start to go up, I I believe them. I believe that this is going to be a drain on the economy. Interest rates are going to continue to go up and investors should be concerned. It's interesting how quickly we've shifted from transitory to uh, him stating inflation is much too high. I think something we can look at is average prices of household essentials, food and fuel. They rose more than 16% in February uh, when compared to a year earlier and expected to continue to increase based on the war in Ukraine. So uh, we're seeing this in real time. I think some states have actually started to enact gas tax holidays is what they're calling them. Uh, Maryland and Georgia become the first states to uh, to temporarily suspend their gas taxes. Maryland's going to be for 30 days, which is about a 36 cent per gallon savings to their consumers, 36.85 cents on diesel fuel. And Georgia's will last through May 31st, which is uh, 29.1 cents on gas and 32.6 cents on diesel. So supposedly there's about another dozen states considering similar measures. It's interesting to see how everyone's kind of racing to figure out how to solve for inflation. I'm a big Barron's fan. It's it's my Saturday morning tradition. I love it better when I get the hard copy and don't have to open my laptop to read it. You know, for most of the pandemic, it was laptop only. But there were two terrific pieces this week, one by Andrew Barry and one by Lisa Bilefus, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I hope I am. Uh, I actually find her commentary each week really among the most astute pieces I read during the week. And I do read a lot of research. Her take on what's happening in the markets is really spot on. But she was one of the people that pointed out, I had never seen this before, Lonnie, that um, you know people talk about core inflation and core inflation CPI being you know, at that, I guess it's 10% level, if I'm not mistaken, or perhaps that, that's PPI. And when you strip out food and energy, which most people do to get the core number, you know, it's a couple percentage points less than the headline number, but she turned it around and, and she referred to the same number that you did, which is if you look at the, you know, the converse of the core, which is includes only essentials, only energy and food, that was up 16% in February. And Andrew Barry expanded upon that in his piece, you know, lest you think it's only energy that's driving this. He said that food alone was up 13% last month, which is quite alarming. It's alarming not just on what it can do to the economy. A lot of times we get so laser focused on the economy and what this does to bond values and lending and the 
the pace of the economy, but this is a real tax that hits the lower class uh, incredibly hard. You know, in, in the beginning of, of Bialfus's piece, she talked about the average grocery spend being up a hundred bucks uh, for a two week grocery spend. And that's a lot of money for people at the lower end of the spectrum. So uh, aside from all of that, all of what can happen to the economy, you know, there's a big human effect to this as well. What is the impact to borrowers and others in the industry? So turning it back to, you know, kind of what we do this podcast for, which is CRE and CMBS and so forth. Um, we spoke last week about how new issue lending was being done in the 440 range, 450 range, meaning borrowers could come to the CMBS market and they'd be quoted loans, you know, around four and a half percent now, up from about three and a half percent a couple of months ago. So a sizable move. And the four and a half percent is just an average, right? Some property types will be lower, some property types will be higher and so forth. But we said that number when we were about 25, 30 basis points lower in the treasury curve. Rates are up another 30 basis points since our last podcast, give or take. So now you have to think that what the desks are quoting for you know the big issuers that bring CMBS bonds to market, you're probably at 475. So borrowers who had become very used to saving money on refinance, for almost all of them now, that savings has been erased. There is no savings to be had. Two other thoughts about that, and then I'm going to turn it over to Lonnie for, for a cap rate discussion. But the second thing is, in the past, people could trade down in term to take a shorter term loan to save on the interest rate, right? So if the 10-year was at four, maybe the five-year was at three, and they could save 100 basis points and do that. But because the yield curve is so flat right now, the five-year is really right on top of the 10-year there's not a lot of interest rate savings going from 10 to five. And if you roll the dice and if you tap the CRE CLO market and say, I'll do the floating rate thing and I'll lock in an index today for the next, you know, couple of months, month or two at 25 basis points, which is where SOFR is, I'll roll the dice. That's, that is dicey, you know, uh, to, to um, stick with the, uh, the craps, metaphor, it is uh, rolling the dice that that 25 basis point sulfur, if you believe the Fed is going up to a terminal rate of 275 over the next 18 months, and then whatever you're paying, if you're paying a, a two and a half point spread on your floating rate loan, your coupon goes from two and a half to perhaps five and a half over time. So there's not a lot of ways to game the system now to keep your interest rate low and that's a headwind for uh, people looking to refinance. Yeah, I think it's it's definitely, it's something the market's going to have to react to. Uh, the CLO market that you mentioned, last year I had a total issuance of about $45 billion. So at that time, people thought maybe they were benefiting from that shorter term, cheaper debt. Now they're going to roll into something, you know, call it 18, 24 months later, where they may have to leverage those 12-month extension options and pay a, a hefty premium to do that. Uh, versus finding some permanent debt that they're not satisfied with the interest rate. We talked a little bit about cap rates last week. You know, we're starting to see stuff pop up in the in the feeds where, you know, property owners are buying assets at two and a half uh, cap rate going in and financing at four and a half. That's not the equation that they want. Um, so it'll be very interesting just to see how how this plays out. I think you know it's still relatively new. Like rates, even over the last three weeks that we've been talking about them, like they haven't stayed. They're kind of fluctuating. I know community banks, I've seen some stuff online where they're still offering very favorable terms. Obviously that comes with the personal guarantee that some of these structured products don't have. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if there's a shift there where people are willing to sign on the dotted line and have, you know, a guarantee attached to it for a better interest rate and maybe a little more favorable terms, or if they just learn to underwrite and, you know, pay the higher cost of capital to finance in the, uh, the existing structures. So Lonnie, let, let's stick with the cap rate thing for a minute. You know, historically, cap rates and interest rates fairly well correlated, not perfectly. Rates come down, cap rates come down. Sometimes, you know, rates will come down fast and, and cap rates will follow a little bit later. Uh, same thing on the way up, right? Cap rates could react a little bit slower. Uh, there seems to be some debate this time about can rates go up 
significantly without impacting cap rates, which have been just extraordinarily low, especially in things like multifamily. Yeah. So, you know, we looked for some research. We actually found a couple of reports that went back over a time series. And to your point, they pretty much have, you know, as interest rates went up, cap rates went up. As interest rates came down, cap rates came down historically. I think what we're going to see right now is almost a short-term bubble where you have so much liquidity, such short supply of assets available for purchase. Interest rates may continue to go up and cap rates may continue to go down. So placement of dry powder on the sidelines is going to overrun fundamentals in the short term. And we're going to see a continued acceleration in price from, from what we can tell. Partly due because as you kind of let off this segment, borrowers are not incentivized now to trade out of assets based on interest rate or tapping into a better financing uh, structure. So if I'm at three and a half and I refinance or I have to sell my asset and buy something new at, at four and a half, I'm a little less motivated to do that than I was 90 days ago where I could have maybe swapped um, at the same interest rate or maybe even got a better rate. So, you know, I think we're going to see this bifurcation maybe deviates from the historical norm of short term, very limited supply, super excess capital, compression of cap rates, increase in price, even though interest rates are going up. But eventually those things have to correlate. Interest rates going up should bring values down because math at some point is still undefeated. Well, I'll close with one more thought before Martha turns us to our next segment. We talked last week about, you know, has any of this volatility shut down the markets? Is CMBS still open? Are they still lending? Last week, we pointed to one conduit deal being in the market. This past week, we got two more deals in. I'm not sure if any of them priced today. Uh, I wasn't kind of looking at my screen all day long, but as of this morning, we had three deals waiting to launch from three different major issuers slash investment or commercial banks. And that's a positive sign. It means that uh, several different banks are out there keeping their windows open, making loans, certainly at higher spreads and at higher rates, but it is a sign of the market functioning, which is a good thing. Breaking into the property sector news, let's start with hotel news. We had a couple stories that we wanted to go over. Let's, uh, let's start with the Chicago story. Yes, we've been following New York and Chicago quite a bit. Those are two of the four or five worst performers when it comes to hotels. Whereas much of the country has recovered, we've seen occupancy tick up, we've seen RevPAR tick up, we've seen a lot of these defaulted loans cure. Our listeners will remember that we've gone from about a 25% delinquency rate to less than half of that in the hotel segment. But New York, Chicago, and a couple of other cities still struggle. Last week, it was the Sheridan in New York that sold for, I think, a 52% discount to where it sold in 2007. You know, this week we got a kind of a lousy Chicago hotel comp. Sunstone sold two hotels for 130 million. That's down from a combined value of about 206 million at one point. So not quite as bad as the Sheraton one, but still down 35%. 40%, something like that. The two properties are uh, the Embassy Suite Chicago and the Hilton Garden Inn Hotels. They total 729 keys, sold for 178K per room. The story comes via the real deal. You know, I, I think Chicago and New York, the combination of still kind of muted overseas demand, right? Travel from Europe and Asia, lack of people coming back to the office and staying. We're making business trips to New York and Chicago, along with just kind of a lackluster rebound in their economy thus far. I think they have a lot of work to go. I think this is our third or fourth story on the Magnificent Mile in the last month or so. And I wonder if we have to start referencing that in some other type of Prince-esque, formerly known as the Magnificent Mile, because the uh, the mall property, the uh, the hotel properties, these numbers don't bode well for them. I think you know, they also suffer from really cold winters and you combine all those things together. Hotel travel just hasn't been what it should be. Hopefully this spring will bring some, some new life into Chicago and the city will start to rebound a little bit. A couple of others. One is a little tongue in cheek and one is uh, kind of interesting. The one that's caught our eye earlier this week, the value of 
Uh, the Aruba Marriott Resort was cut sharply. This is a 411 key full service hotel. It backs both a senior loan and a B note that total 190 million. Those two loans collateralize a 2018 single asset deal. The loan has been with special servicing for a while. The hotel was valued at 314 million in 2017. This past month, that value was lowered to 212 million. Why did that catch my attention? Well, I thought it lent itself to a conversation between, you know, what the risk is to these investors in this particular single asset deal. And what we have here is a situation where there's 190 million in total debt. There's a value on the property of 212 million. So you have about a, I don't know, 20% window of excess equity, give or take. But when you look at the details of the debt package, that means the entirety of what the borrower took out to fund this loan, the A note has a balance of 135 million and the rest of the B note, 55 million is second in priority. So they're gonna take the first loss. So if you're the A note guy, you don't feel terrible at this. You say, I still have $80 million of equity behind me. I still feel pretty good about a money good on this asset. But if you're the B note holder, this cut in value has reduced your equity from about 150 million to about 20 million. So here in this particular case, you're a little bit nervous as the BP guy is, I hope this 211 or 212 is not headed to 180 or 170. And my equity in this whole is negative. So for people that trade CMBS and people that know CMBS, this is kind of second nature. But for people that are tourists in the CMBS market, a lot of these structured deals are complicated. There's multiple levels of subordination and knowing the details matters when you're looking at whether something like this is newsworthy for your investment or not. Yeah, a little silver lining on that one though, Manus. In 2020, this property posted debt service coverage ratio of 0.66. Occupancy was down at 31%. And at least through the first nine months of 21, those numbers moved up to 1.1 and 54%. Um, so it'll be interesting to see as we head into, you know, the second quarter of 22, if they're able to continue to bring it back. And hopefully this 211 will be a low water mark and the property will stabilize and come back, you know, in some form or fashion closer to that origination valuation. It is a little funny because that travel destination, I mean, of course you have to get on a plane to get there. So that takes away some of the demand. You can't drive there like you can the Jersey Shore or Orlando if you're in the Southeast or something like that. But it is a flyaway destination but it is a vacation destination. I think I'm surprised that hasn't rebounded faster than it has, but hopefully 2022 is a better year for that property, even more so than 2021. Uh, this next one, you want to lead with this one, Lonnie, you're a big football fan. I'll let you talk about the Arizona Cardinals parting ways with a longtime partner. Yeah. So according uh, to the Phoenix Business Journal, give them a shout out. The uh, Arizona Cardinals are parting ways with the Renaissance Phoenix Glendale Hotel and Spa this year. The Cardinals have used the hotel for lodging during their summer training camp since 2013, and they're moving their headquarters to the Wigwam Hotel in Litchfield Park this summer. The Renaissance Phoenix Glendale Hotel and Spa backs about a $44 million loan, which represents about 7.5% of a 2015 deal. Their financials are still significantly below pre-COVID levels, and this loss of the Cardinal contract will be of significant interest to CMBS investors because I would assume that that propped up some of the financial performance over the last few years. So it'll be interesting to, to keep our eye on this. You know, I don't know, this is one of those, it's almost like a single tenant retail when you're counting on a, an NFL football team taking a room block for their training camp and they decide to cancel. There's probably not a whole lot of other teams willing to jump in and take those rooms. So you look in 2021, their DSR was only 0.16. So significantly underwater, occupancy was 40%. You take away that big chunk of room, which probably covers you from about mid-July to mid-August. And who knows, it might not just be the team. You may have fans there and families and everything else. That's a, that's a big gut punch. And as you mentioned, Lonnie, this particular asset represents almost 7.5% of a 2015 deal. So this is, you know, kind of really disappointing micro news, probably not as disappointing for Cardinal fans as perhaps if they were to lose Kyler Murray as their quarterback, which is 
rumored by some that they're not going to extend his contract, but not extending the contract at the Renaissance Phoenix, not a, not a good turn for CMBS investors. So while we're on the subject of sports, I got to ask you, how are you doing on your brackets? Well, Lonnie, so, I mean, I got to let Lonnie start. He's got, he's got a, a stake got in a the game tonight. He's got a stake in the Sweet 16. Yeah, so I'm actually, uh, I'm, I'm reporting this podcast, as you guys know, in, uh, in sunny Lubbock, Texas today. And so I teach class tonight from, uh, from 5 to 8 Central, and I think uh, Texas Tech game starts at 8 o'clock. So it'll be one of those nights where uh, they, they certainly don't want to wait until uh, class ends at 8. They're going to be pressuring me to get out of there a little bit early. So, you know, looking forward to seeing what Texas Tech can do. They're playing Coach K in the uh, Duke Blue Devils, so that's that's got all kinds of you know, additional commentary and undertones with that. It could be his last game. And then uh, my Rock Chalk Jayhawks are still looking pretty good too. So that's all I know about the bracket. I've been working so much, I haven't really paid attention to see how my bracket is. Either that or I threw it in the trash because it's toast. <laughs> I know we do have some dookies out there. So, you know, I think uh, you're on the other side of that, uh, that game tonight from a lot of our listeners. And how are you doing? I'm doing okay. I did lose on Auburn. I was actually at that game, Auburn and Miami, and Auburn looked uh, flat as could be, but I still got my Gonzaga, Houston, and Purdue picks. So you got got uh, hope. We got hope. I'm actually rooting for St. Peter's. So let's uh, let's hope the Jersey City guys are able to to win against Purdue. That'll be a tough one. Here, quick question for you, man. Is that the uh, the Auburn coach uh, Bruce Pearl? Is he as buff in real life as he looks on tv i think that guy could bench press half his team if he needed to i, I didn't notice that he did look like stout but i think it's like more dad bod than schwarzenegger if that's what you're if that's okay. what you're looking for <laughs> i've seen him get upset and rip his suit off a few times so i didn't i didn't know maybe it's one of those superhero suits with the padding <laughs> So turning to retail, we saw a couple of store closures that came out of Walmart, of all places. Yeah, can you imagine? It's, you know, the, one of the great performers of the COVID time, along with Target and Home Depot and Lowe's, a rare store closing set of announcements this week uh, in Cincinnati and in Louisville, both. There'll be two superstores, super centers closing in the next couple of weeks, so uh, very surprising news, but it does. It is a reminder to those that invest in commercial real estate and those that invest in CMBS that even the best borrowers throw back keys sometimes. Even the best retailers have underperforming stores that they close, right? and even you know the best tenants that you think are going to be there at the corporate side for thirty years pick up and move from. New Jersey to Florida or Texas or Arizona or somewhere else. So, you know, it's it, it, commercial real estate is not a homogeneous market and different things happen and it's lumpy and the Walmart store closings tell us that. And, and a, another story from a Vermont shopping mall that actually was broken by our sister company, Commercial Real Estate Direct. Yes, this is a little inside baseball. Uh, this is a CMBS story. A mall in Vermont, in South Burlington, sold this week for $60 million. It was the University Mall, purchased by Taconic Capital Partners. So why was this noteworthy? Well, it was noteworthy for four or five reasons. First of all, the property backed about $88 million in CMBS debt. So this was sitting on a very big loss, a big loss that was forthcoming. Everybody knew it the property was underwater for a long time. However, uh, the property had been most recently valued uh, via the servicer data in the CMBS files at only $42 million, not 60. Um, What our sister company, Commercial Real Estate Direct, several months ago wrote a story saying that Taconic was on the verge of buying this for 60 million. So a savvy CMBS investor if they had been looking for these bonds, could have picked up these bonds from somebody who had thought this thing is going to get liquidated at 42 million. It ultimately got liquidated at 60 million, which was, you know, considerably more proceeds than people were expecting. So that's number one, that, you know, these, these opportunities exist out there. And we'd actually put a trading alert about this, I don't know, maybe a year ago that this thing was going to trade for close to 60 million using that commercial real estate direct story. 
So that, that's one angle for this. Um, angle number two, I have to give props to the special servicer here. Uh, a couple of years ago, the special servicer turned down bids of 40 to 45 million. So sometimes special servicers get heat for waiting too long, seeing a prop property devalue, spiral lower over time, more and more fees and expenses add up and losses grow. In this particular case, the special servicer really made the right call here, holding out for more money uh, and really benefited bondholders. And then I'll leave it with a last thought, which, man, this is real inside baseball, but I will, I will try to explain it as best I can. This loan had been in default for a long time, meaning servicer advances of principal, interest, uh, and other expenses had been accumulating bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger each month. When this property gets sold and, and $60 million is recovered, that $60 million is not principal. That $60 million has to go through two different waterfalls. First, it goes to repay interest that is due on the loan through a waterfall. Once all interest is paid back on that loan, what's ever left is the recovery of principal. And why do I bring this up? I bring this up because there was so much deferred interest on the bonds in this particular issue. And there was so much recovered, so much more than was expected that the first lost bond in this deal, the bond that was going to be completely wiped out with this loss, got a 50% repayment of their balance of their bond just by the fact that they were repaid deferred interest. So this is, is, is very much inside baseball, but if I were to guess, I would bet that people that were marking these bonds on trading desks were marking these at probably five cents on the dollar, seven cents, 10 cents. And this bond recovered 50 cents on the dollar when the remittance was paid out this month. And the point I'm trying to make here is that if you're going to play in this space, or if you're looking for unusual opportunities, they do exist. And where they exist, you really have to know the mechanics of how bond waterfalls work. It's, it's you know, it's, it, there's a risk reward there. If, you, if you're willing to put in the time to understand how people get paid back with big recoveries, sometimes you find nuggets out there that, you know, can give you a 10 bag or like maybe somebody got for this first loss bond in this 2007 deal. Yeah, man, thank you for walking us through the waterfall. I think we'll probably have to put something together, push out to our clients that, that explains that in writing so that people can see it. Because to your point, that's where there's a lot of opportunity in this market. It's nuanced, but if you understand that you can really uh, do well. I think this is really something that shines the light on the special service, or you mentioned them taking a lot of heat sometimes. Their, uh, their function is to return as much to the bondholders as possible and try to make them whole. This was a 2007 deal. And as you mentioned, they had lower bids in the $45 million range and they held tight. And so it's good to see the system working as it's intended, even if it takes a long time for them to, uh, to actually close out something like this. But in the end, they did what they were supposed to and everyone benefits from that. Turning to multifamily, an area that we've seen a lot of transactions and actually a, a lot of good performance, we have a couple of deals that underscore that. It seems like uh, we don't go a week or two without seeing more records being set and, and extraordinary value run up. You know, I, I feel like it's every three days. It's, it's a new uh, high watermark. Uh, two stories that we, we saw this week uh, in Phoenix, we saw Copper Palms. Uh, this is not a record-breaking sale, but it's, it's just unique in just how much value has been returned to the equity investors in this particular property. Uh, it's a 206-unit property in Phoenix. Uh, Tides Equity came in and bought it at a value that is 4x what this thing was worth in 2015. So it was worth $14 million in 2015 sold for 59 million. By the way, Tides Equity just really owns everything in Phoenix. This is their 59th purchase in that MSA. This particular deal, it's unusual also in that the property backed a 2015 private label deal. Normally this stuff finds its way into Fannie and Freddie debt, but there should be a defeasance coming 
uh, for that particular property. Uh, similar story in Atlanta, the Carlisle of Sandy Springs. Uh, here it's a 389 unit multifamily property sold for triple what it was worth in 2014. So 34 million in 2014 sold for 105.6 million. So just, you know, um, at some point the, the merry-go-round or whatever we want to call it has to stop and, and, and values have to keep, you know, uh, doubling every four or five years. Uh, but for right now, it's, it's just been an extraordinary run. This is a, a perfect example of 1031 proceeds from these deals having to find a new home over the next few months. So I, you know, the, the excess gains on these are going to be redistributed into other investments and, you know, probably other markets. And that's where we're going to continue to see those rapid price increases in secondary and tertiary markets across the U.S. So let me give a couple of shout outs here because I didn't do it when I talked about these. Uh, the Phoenix story that came from multi-housing news and the Atlanta story came from real estate business online. So we like to give credit where, uh, where it's appropriate. Turning to office, we have seen in the last couple of weeks, Castle Systems reported that occupancy at the 10 largest office markets is up 40%. And interestingly, in New York went from 33% to 36. And unfortunately, San Francisco is still at the bottom at uh, only 29%. And I'm sure you guys saw the story that Morgan Stanley is now limiting the number of days that people can work from home. They are asking you to come into the office and you're limited from being at home for uh, only 90 days per year. Well, 90 days a year sounds to me like Mondays and Fridays off, right? We work about 240 days a year when you figure in uh, weekends and national holidays and regular vacation. And 90 days is you know, about 40% of that, right? So uh, it's a, just another way of talking about the fact that you have to come in three days a week. And I think that that's, I, I think people ask all the time is, are we going to forget about this COVID thing, go back to five days a week at some point, or is this the new normal? And, and if I had to put my money on the line, I would say the three-day work week is the new normal. Yeah, I agree. I think they were ac they're actually quoted in the story as saying, uh, we developed our long-term approach in consultation with advisors and are offering different options to enable them to maintain flexibility that balances their needs as well as those of our clients and our business. So it sounds like, you know, they had a pretty good PR ready statement available that uh, checked all the boxes for their internal stakeholders as well as their clients and uh, other business partners. So let's focus on the, the big office story that uh, takes us to New York. So this is one we've been following for a long time. We pointed it out to our readers of Trepwire via a trading alert about a year ago that L Brands would be leaving its space at 1740 Broadway. That's a big Midtown Manhattan office. It backs a single asset CMBS deal. The loan is a little over 300 million. L Brands has had, I guess their lease ends uh, this month, 69% of the space in that building. They announced about a year ago they would not be renewing when the lease ended, leaving the property with a big hole to fill. Earlier in 2019, we had reported that law firm Davis and Gilbert had planned to move its offices from 17 Broadway. Uh, that law firm had almost 16% of the space. So between the two, you're looking at 85% vacancy in that particular asset. And Commercial Observer broke a story this week that announced that Blackstone would be giving back the keys to that asset. So um, handing back the keys, I think everybody who's been listening to this for a long time knows what that means. But for new listeners, it means, you know, they are the owner of this property. At a time, it was valued at over 600 million. It had an LTV of 51 at the time the loan was made in 2015. They think that there's not enough equity value in there to keep paying debt service on this loan and rehabbing this particular property. So they are giving back the keys and this loan will default. Yeah, it's really interesting at that LTV level, Manus. I mean, 51% uh, at the time of origination, 
and they feel like there's nothing there for them to uh, to save. So it's, you know, this may be the beginning of some additional office deals like this, where, um, you know, you look at it on paper, it seemed like a low leverage property. I know this is a little different because they had such a high, you know, dependency on just two tenants, but this wasn't an 80, 80% LTV deal, you know, at underwriting. This was something that seemed to be fairly low leverage and uh, they're willing to walk away and throw the keys back. This is similar to the story we saw in Chicago with Bank of America leaving, uh, I think it was 135 LaSalle there and, and all indications there are that the borrower will give back the keys uh, at that property as well. And there's, there's a couple of lessons to come out of this for people that, you know, again, are tourists to some of these markets. The first is that, you know, the time to realize that a bond may have issues isn't when a, somebody's lease ends. It usually happens six months to a year when the news starts to come out that this firm has moved on or this firm has taken a lease somewhere else. So normally these events take place. If, you, you know, if you're somebody who's new to a trading desk or think you wanna become a, you know, you're a student, you wanna become a trader, this is what traders do, right? Their job is to know that L Brands was planning to leave or had signed a new lease 12 months ago and that this could have happened, right? And to price this risk uh, accordingly. Same thing with the Bank of America news um, in Chicago. You know, the second lesson here is that, you know, this is in that category of properties that Lonnie and I had talked about. It, it's not a well-positioned asset for the new economy, right? It's not on the far west side. It's a dated building. It needs a lot of spit and polish to get it back to where it's where it was. And if I were to guess, it probably needs a lot of environmental upgrades to get it to that level where you get that lead certification. Maybe it has it already, maybe I'm wrong, but it's not something where L Brands leaves and this is turn on the lights, show the property, sign the lease. This, this is something where you have to really invest in it. And Steve Quozo today in the New York Post said, you know, the owners had been hoping for 80 bucks a square foot. And this is not an 80 bucks a square foot type of building anymore. And uh, I think that had a lot to do with Blackstone tossing back the keys. Turning to shout outs, we have a couple that are uh, more than just your hello, I'm doing well. Steve B, for example, gave us a comment about the Mall of America last year sued Dick's Last Resort, which is a, a chain restaurant and bar. And apparently uh, the judge sided with the mall ruling that they owed roughly 680,000 in back rent and related charge, which was the full amount that the mall was seeking. And I do believe that the Mall America had received back rent um, in other lawsuits as well with some of their tenants. I got a couple of shout outs that I'll throw out there. Uh, one is from Lewis, who gave us a couple of different threads. His first thread was on, you know, the relationship that Lonnie was talking about between cap rates and interest rates. You know, I think he falls into the camp of uh, there's so much liquidity out there that cap rates will trail interest rates moving higher by a considerable period of time. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. He's also a big UNC Tar Heels fan, and he was happy to see his uh, team get to the Sweet 16. A uh, big win over Baylor a couple days ago. And another sh shout out to Rick and Jay on the West Side, who are listeners, and uh, our friend Joe M., who also uh, checked in with us earlier today. And Lucius uh, had a couple comments. One of them was on the micro apartment story that we covered last week. And uh, so he had a question. He said, anyone who's willing to live and work from a 500 square foot box belongs in a straight jacket, which will probably help the office market bounce back a little bit. And a shout out to Cherry and our team who were at the CRE Tech Conference in San Diego. Cherry had Will Froling and Mike Benz at their booth to show our CRE income and expense aggregate data. So thanks. Deborah Morgan, who we've talked about a few times, recommended our podcast in response to Fort Worth Chris, asking the best to listen to. And a couple other notes. We have our future CRE Leaders Awards program actually accepts award nominations for kids who are super bright, graduating from undergraduate studies in real estate or finance. And I got to tell you guys, the last class was so impressive, made me feel like a slacker. 
you know, I'll, I'll give you something else that, you know, maybe will not make you feel a, like a slacker. You know, I'm supposed to go to Orlando next week. And the funny thing about, I haven't been there a long time. I haven't been there in about 15 years. And the funny thing about Orlando is you don't even get to the third syllable if you're talking to your kids before everybody thinks you're taking the whole family on vacation. And, you know, you start seeing the phone light up, you know, one daughter texting the other, I think we're going to Orlando. And then you have to break it to them that, you know, it's not a family vacation. This is a business trip. I'm going down there. I'm speaking to some people. And then they come back to me with, you're not going to talk about, you know, buildings and interest rates and hashtags and pound signs. So I take a pause and I go, hashtags and pound signs. You mean numbers? Numbers? I said, those are numbers that you're talking about. So, you know, some of these uh, young kids that you're right, they're incredibly bright. They make you feel like slackers and Others just kind of put you in your place, like my kids. Well, I was going to take a take a chance here, Martha, and throw a shout out to the uh, the Texas Tech students. I uh, came in early to uh, Lubbock today and did a, a full day seminar on our trip loan product with about forty students, uh, undergraduate here at, at Texas Tech. And I'll tell you, the uh, you know these folks have some really talented um, technical skills capabilities. I, I gave them a quiz at the end, and um, you know after just a few hours, they were able to do some fairly complex work in our platform so it's really uh, it's exciting to see um you know this new new tech age version of uh, of college and what that what that means for our you know cre businesses i tease them sometimes via the podcast but yeah there's a lot of impressive young kids out there and it can be quite humbling and you know guys today literally marks the two-year anniversary of our podcast so for those of you who have not been on the long ride with us we started the podcast in response to the COVID-induced recession and how it was impacting a number of our clients and influencers in the market. And it's been an interesting ride these last two years. And we've, we've pivoted from worrying about employment and uh, pandemic numbers while we're not out of the woods yet to, uh, to inflation and war and some other things. There's been so much to dislike about the last 24 months, you know, the human effect of COVID the inflationary effect on, you know, lower income people, the war, uh, as you mentioned, Martha, all those things are such negatives. For me, one of the great positives of the last two years is I probably doubled my friend group in the industry from pre-COVID, just from people pinging us in emails or making phone calls. And, and the debate is just always so positive and healthy. I always end up learning something from it. Uh, I've had golf rounds out of it and coffees with people and drinks and so forth. And you know, I guess every cloud has a silver lining. And for me, that's what the last two years silver lining has been. I would agree. With that, we'll close. Thanks to our producer, Haley Keen. Join us next week as we look at what's happened during the week and how it may be impacting you. If you have a question or comment, send an email to podcast at trep.com and subscribe to the podcast with your favorite provider. Thank you as always for listening and stay well. All right. <laughs>